This is Colin McGarry with Walking DD. Now in this episode we're not really walking DD and normally I'd set up a backdrop and lights in my office. I thought as it's fine we've got this lovely natural backdrop and be in the forest. Now the thumbnail says Mr James Bond, a Welshman and Operation Husky. Now Mr James Bond wasn't Sean Connery or Roger Moore but Ian Fleming who invented him. And we met him in the episode on Operation Bodyguard. He was the one who was watching Pujol in the casino. He was a naval intelligence officer and he received 51 suggestions for deceiving the enemy. Most of them completely unfeasible. Now the suggestion number 28 involved a dead body. It was pretty gruesome. He just dismissed it. The Operation Husky was the invasion of Sicily. And as for the Welshman, we'll meet him later. Now the British have been in North Africa since <coughs> the beginning of the war, and the Americans since November 1942 with Operation Torch. Now they wanted to get into Europe through Italy. And to get to Italy, go through Sicily. This was such an obvious move that the Germans were reinforcing their defences in Sicily. When your enemy knows where you plan to attack, you can do two things. You can attack elsewhere, or you can make him believe that you're going to attack elsewhere. So that's what they did. So the idea was, they wanted the Germans to think they were going to attack into Greece, or perhaps Sardinia, preferably Greece. Uh, Ian Fleming was consulted and he resuscitated this preposterous idea of using a dead body. Now he didn't actually do the planning. He got two men from intelligence to actually do it. They were called Chumley and Montague. Now Charles Chumley had been in the Air Force. He had a wax moustache and he always introduced himself as Chumley, C-H-O-L-O-M. E Y. Looks like Cholomly, but pronounced Chumley. Ewan Montagu was a barrister and he wanted to go to sea. So he joined the supplementary reserve. But once his commanders found out he was a barrister, they put him into intelligence. He was used to seeing through deception and creating it. They formed the counter espionage section 17M. Now the idea had been presented to Fleming, suggestion number 28, was to use a dead body and plant it somewhere where it would be found by the enemy and have documents on it, false documents, which would deceive the enemy. Pretty simple in idea, but uh, very difficult to actually execute. Now they wanted a body that could be made to look like it drowned and would have wounds on it that could look like it had fallen off a boat or been in a plane crash. As a Bentley Purchase was chief coroner at the St Pancras Mortuary, Montague asked him to keep an eye out for a suitable corpse. Glendale Michaels lived in Abba de Goed in Wales. Now his father committed suicide in 1925 after being made redundant from the coal mine due to dwindling coal supplies. He actually stabbed himself in the neck. Glendower had to sign the death certificate for his father. Now he moved to London and his mental health was diminishing. In 1943, he committed suicide by taking rat poisoning. This was a perfect corpse. He had no family and Purchase assured that nobody could see that he'd killed himself by rat poisoning. Montague later said that even though bodies were very common in a war, getting one that filled the criteria was quite difficult. They wanted somebody no family, and as I said, Purchase assured him that nobody could tell that the body had died from rat poisoning, or that the water in his lungs wasn't seawater. They didn't have CIA capabilities at that time. The body was put in the freezer. Montague and Chumley now had their body and they could start the operation. Their strange sense of humour and dealing with the body led them to baptise it 
Operation Mincemeat. Now the body had to be believable as a real person. They chose the name of Major William Martin, a Royal Marines officer. Now the uniform was easy to find, but not the underwear. Everything was rationed during the war, even underwear, and nobody was willing to give any up. But the problem was solved by a warden of a Oxford College who got knocked off his bike and killed, and he left a good supply of underwear. Now they needed a photo. They dressed the body up and took a photo of it, but it looked like a dead body. So they needed somebody that looked like the body. Montague scoured the streets of London for weeks, trying to find somebody. And finally there was somebody in their offices that was the exact double of the body. Martin's wallet had to be filled with elements of his life. In spy jargon, that's called wallet litter. They had bus tickets, cinema tickets, and there was even a letter from a bank manager about his overdraft. A real Lloyds Bank bank manager wrote the letter on Lloyds Bank headed notepaper. Chumley wore Martin's uniform to give it some natural looking wear. They wanted a love story. They got secretaries from MI5 to provide photos. And finally it was Jean Leslie who was chosen. And they called her Pam. There was even an invoice for an expensive ring from a real shop in London for 15 pounds, 10 shillings and sixpence. They sometimes started believing in these characters they'd made up. Montague started going out with Jean as Pam. Now his family had moved to America to be out of the way and it got to such a state that his mother, who he's living with, wrote to his wife to tell her she should come back to England. It was now April and Hitler was reinforcing the defences in Sicily. The Montague and Chumley drafted many letters from Sir Archibald Nye to General Alexander in Africa and each one was torn up, it wasn't satisfactory. Finally they asked General Archibald Nye to draft a letter and that was much better with the military jargon in it, it sounded more authentic. Now the letter, without spelling it out directly, gave the impression that the invasion was going to be in Greece, not Sicily. After months of preparation, the plan was ready. Now the letter had an eyelash placed in it, so that when the British got it back, if their eyelash had gone, they'd know somebody had read it. It was already April, and the invasion into Sicily was nigh. They started to prepare the body. Now they got it dressed, because the feet were frozen, they couldn't get the boots on. So they used an electric heater to thaw out the feet. The body was placed in a canister. Now it had to be driven up to the west coast of Scotland to put it in the submarine, which is going to take it to Spain. They were driven through the night by St. John Jock Forceful, an ex-racing driver who was a chauffeur for MI5. The four of them went to Scotland in his souped up van. They drove through the night and into most of the next day. HMS Sarah was the submarine waiting for them. His captain, Bill Jewell, was the only member of the crew who knew what was in the canister. It was going to take four days to get off the coast of Spain. Now, Spain was neutral, even though it had a fascist dictator who'd come to power with the help of Hitler. Franco didn't want to get into another war just now. But the Franco regime turned a blind eye to German agents. They could work freely. Now, a particular agent they were targeting, who lived in the port of Huelva, south of Spain, his name was Adolf Klaus. Klaus and his agents were responsible for the loss of many British ships. They'd screw the horizon with binoculars and then inform U-boats of their whereabouts. Now in the early hours of 30th of April 1943, the HMS Sarah surfaced just behind a fleet of fishing boats. They had to wait till it went over them. And they took the body out the canister, took it up to the deck and pushed it into the sea. Now all they could do was hope 
that the plan was going to work. Antonio Rai Maria found the body. He was out fishing in a small boat and he took it to the shore and he noticed there was bruises on it and also there was a briefcase attached to the wrist. That was handed to the coroner to do an autopsy and because it was obviously a British subject the British consul was present and he was in on the secret. Now he was worried that a detailed inspection of the body might show that it had been dead for a lot longer than just being in the sea for a day or two and thankfully it was very hot and the body was smelling a bit so he suggested to the coroner that due to the heat and the stench he might want to call it a day and the coroner was only too pleased to accede to that request so that was as far as it went. The body was handed back to the British and it was buried in the local cemetery near Huelva with full military honours because this was a major of the Royal Marines. Adolf Klaus was watching the ceremony and from room 13 in London Montague and Chumley were watching Klaus. Now the briefcase had been handed over to the Spanish Navy and now the British wanted Klaus to get hold of it. Then Montague and Chumley sent lots of messages to the consul in Spain about the whereabouts of the briefcase and telling him that it mustn't fall into unwelcome hands. Now these messages were intercepted by Klaus and that convinced him that these documents were very important. But the plan didn't go as planned completely. The Spanish authorities wouldn't play ball with Klaus and they sent the briefcase to Madrid. It was now Eric Kulental who had the mission to get the documents. He was a top Nazi spy in Madrid. Now Bletchley Park were monitoring messages to see if there's anything about these uh, documents. Kulental asked Admiral Canaris, who was the head of the Abwehr, for help. And nine days later, they were allowed to see the documents. An agent in the Spanish Navy gave them an hour to photograph everything. Now Kulental saw that these documents were very important and a good agent would start asking questions. They might even have asked for a second autopsy. But uh, Kulental had a flaw as far as the Nazis were concerned. His grandmother was Jewish. So he didn't want to make waves. Now he took these documents to Berlin personally by plane and they were scrutinised and they rapidly rose up the command chain. Now Goebbels was a bit suspicious. He thought this could be a big British joke. But Hitler said, no, this is real. And so Goebbels thought, well, that's good enough for him. On May the 12th, nine days after the body had been dropped in the sea, Bletchley Park intercepted messages warning the commanders in the Mediterranean to prepare for an attack into Greece. Montague continued the story by putting the name of Martin in the obituary in the Times next to other airmen who'd been shot down in the area. Now Goebbels read the Times every day. Churchill received a telegram. Mince meat has been swallowed hook, line and sinker. He knew what that meant. Hitler moved a panzer division to Greece and other troop movements followed. There had been one division in Greece and now there were eight. Torpedo boats were sent from Sicily to Greece and squadrons of planes. On July the 9th, the German Mediterranean commander predicted an attack into Greece. And the next day, Operation Husky started into Sicily. Thanks to the fact that the Germans had depleted their forces in Sicily, casualties were a lot lower than expected. There was 1,400 casualties as opposed to 10,000 expected and 12 ships were sunk instead of 300 which they'd expected. Just two weeks later, Italy capitulated, Mussolini was arrested and now Germany had to occupy the whole of mainland Italy. It wasn't until 1998 that the grave of Major Martin 
was changed to include the name of Glindoa Michaels. There are several easy ways you can help the channel. You can tap on like, tap on subscribe plus the bell, make comments, ask questions or even on Patreon. Here are some videos you might like to watch.